everybody to another broadcast of The Soul of the Everyman on the Artist First Radio Network. All past shows are available in podcast form. You can find them at artistfirst.com. Want to make a comment on the show? Hit us up at DJ at artistfirst.com. And here they are, your hosts, a couple of truly amazing people, Michael and Margaret Lyons. <laughs> truly, truly not true. <laughs> Well, this is this is not me. This is my E me. Oh. oh. So this is E Mike. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm Margaret, regardless of what he says. Right. She's regardless of what I say. <laughs> <laughs> and I am being irregarded. Uh, or E regarded. E re- I'm being E regarded. It's like being Beau regarded, except with an E. <laughs> Well, and and all of us, all of you, all you people out there, all you e people are being are e listening to us, and 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 that's part of our topic this evening. Um, you know, one thing we one thing we can say right off the bat is that what we're doing, even though we are delivering it via um, via various means, you know, this kind of of conversation we're having, I would still count in the realm of of a human to human contact first of all we are having a, a conversation the two of us are talking with each other and and you know you people can't see this but we can hear each other directly we're 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 in the same room sometimes we're touching <laughs> <laughs> too much information anyway but no but we're having a human conversation and and you know when when we started this whole thing you know two and a half years ago when when we when we took this faithful plunge and and, uh, and started doing this, one of the reasons that we did it is that um, many many years ago, uh, Margaret and I, or rather Margaret, used to own a store, and that store uh, you know sold um, rocks and gems and jewelry and all sorts of things. But it didn't really matter. What the interesting thing about it was that uh, we would both work there, and we would, you know, in the course in the normal course of of serving. Um, the customers that we would get, we would get into interesting conversations, sometimes between the two of us, sometimes between uh, either of us and one or more of of our customers. And what we would note uh, is that other people in the store, sometimes many other people in the store, would would really stop what they were doing or stop pretending to do what they were doing and and listen in uh, to our conversations because the topics weren't Oh, uh, you know how much is that? Well, that's nine ninety five. No, it was a little bit more than that. It was like ten ninety five. Uh, so we would have these, <laughs> <laughs> we would have these conversations with people. Sometimes uh, we'd have great, great conversations uh, with the kids, because this was the kind of store that kids would come in, and 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 it was a destination place for them. They would come in, they would get to see and play with all the interesting things we had in there. Uh, there were things of for every budget. There were there were things you could buy for a penny and things you could buy for, you know, two pennies. And um, so so these um, this I I would postulate also honed our skills in in both talking to each other, uh, you know, and also talking to the public. So where was I going with all this? It was still a human to human kind of interaction. What we're doing here is is very similar. Uh, we're having a conversation, and and others, all you hundreds of millions of e people out there, or three of you, however many there are, are listening in. So it's still in the realm of of um, of a human experience. Mm-hmm. Well, it's it's something that you wind up doing as a small child anyway, because you would listen to the adult conversation. And sometimes you could make sense of it, and sometimes you couldn't. But it was interesting in that effect, because you're just like, oh, I didn't know that. And uh, we grew up in the age where uh, children were meant to be seen and not heard. Hmm. At least that was in my house. Right. Um, so if you had a question, you had to wait until after the adults were finished with their conversation. Hmm. Um, but it was always an interesting way to figure out what certain things meant 
and how certain people looked at this thing or if there was a happening, a situation, how your parents were looking at this situation, who was stressing, who wasn't stressing, who was problem solving, who was t- p- just taking things apart. Um, fascinating, really. It, it's something that we're, we're born into, frankly. Mm. We're always wanting to listen in on something. Right, and and um, but 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 to our premise, and I don't know if we've explained our premise very well. But at this point, what we're what we we're going to say was that, um, you know, in in our in our current sort of let's say the internet of everything age that we live in, that ability to have sort of this um, human conversation or human contact or human connection has been kind of um, you know, we we put a whole bunch of layers in between. Like now, if you if you actually pick up the phone and you actually call someone and lay your voice electronically in their ear, people are like, is there is there something wrong? Couldn't you have texted, emailed, Snapchatted, this chat, that chat, the other chat, whatever, any other of a million other things? If you're calling me, someone's dead. <laughs> <You know? laughs> if, the, if the phone rings. Now it means that Armageddon is happening, and someone's actually going to tell you it on, you know, you know, words in your ear. And if someone, if God forbid, someone comes to visit you, <laughs> it must mean that you know the world has come to an end. You know, people are coming in our front door. <laughs> and and when at least when I grew up, I knew you grew up, you grew up more in the city. But where I grew up, I, you know, we spent our our whole, especially this time of year, you know, it's summertime. You spend your whole day going to other people's houses without even inviting, without a plan. You just like knocked, they're like a Philistine. You knocked on their door and they opened it and they said, hi. And like, what? You let them in without an appointment? (laughs) Unknown children from who knows where? (laughs) They're in the living room? Ah. So, you know, that's the reaction today. But at that time... We literally just walked in other people's houses and sat down, and they used to give us a drink once in a while. It was great. <laughs> if they were having dinner, they would invite you to, to eat, and you'd say, no, my mom doesn't want me to do that. <laughs> and then you'd go home. Right. Um, it's true. But, but <laughs> it's you know, true. That's a, that seems almost uh, – it seems like something from a bygone age, but it, it wasn't. It was like 1970, you know. It's like, uh, um, well, you know, you would have the the one room that you could inter- entertain guests in. It would always be really clean and in place. Hmm. Nobody was allowed to play in that just in case the guest came over. Someone huh? came dropping by. It wasn't. And dropping then it, by? Yes. Unannounced, like strangers on your doorstep <laughs> that you don't have to shoot at. <laughs> well, that was the thing, though. You had your your living room or the family. This is the place where we entertain the guests. And then there was, you know, they always had a little something just in case a guest came over, a little something to serve. You never touched that. Right. That that was there for like years. That's, that's like <laughs> guest this, food. This, this is, is for the guest. This is for the guest. Until it was getting a little. So, all right, we'll eat that. I'll get something else. Again. Now you can have it. Now it's you can old have enough it. and stale enough so we can feed it to the children. Um, but it's it's funny. But but it's but it's the absolute truth. You, um, you were you as a human being were perfectly comfortable presenting yourself in person on some other human being's porch and just casually knocking on the door and saying, hey, is Johnny on? I want to come and play. And they'd say, sure. (laughs) And you'd walk in and you'd play with Johnny. And, you know, if Johnny wasn't home, they'd say, no, he's over at Stevie's. And you'd just go there. And pretty soon if you had a nice, you know, if you had a house that was conducive to this, you'd have the whole neighborhood in your freaking living room doing whatever. And, you know, mom would say, well, don't, you know, break a window or kill anybody, and that'd be about it. Or go outside, you're making too much noise, and then we'd all just pile outside. So, um... <coughs> oh, dear. Are you okay? See, the reminiscences are killing me. <laughs> oh, dear. Uh, oh, wow. my. They're going to they're gonna have to 
bleep that take out. Take a breath. Take a breath. <clears throat> I think that was the problem. I took took a breath at the wrong moment. Um, uh, the the in the current um, the current way we're doing things, we have we have uh, really layered ourselves and wrapped ourselves up in kind of avatar after avatar after avatar, and some of it is, you know, um, almost sort of forced upon you. You can't. You know, you can't do business in the current world uh, the way we were doing business before. I think people are just not ready <clears throat> to to interact at that level. But but I think we've gone so far away that now when you do something normal, like wave to somebody on the street, they give you a look like, uh, do I owe you money? <laughs> you know, are you gonna? Are you going to physically interact with me? Because I'm armed. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so, so I think our our humanity is suffering, you know. And and the more you separate from people, one of the things that that you know, there's the old saying that familiarity breeds contempt, and and that is true. But actually, unfamiliarity breeds fear. Right. You know, when when you have never extended yourself to meet someone and and kind of familiarize yourself and and the root word of, of familiarize is the same as the root word of family, the familia. You know, when you when you become um, part of a group or part of an of an association of people, you are recognized, you are familiar, and you're you're also not a not only are you not a stranger, but you're not strange. You're not a threat. You're some you're a known quantity. Oh, there's just one of the neighborhood cats. Let him in. Get my corn dog. It'll be fine. You know. <laughs> You know, but if you're now, uh, everybody's a stranger and everybody's somebody you never met before. Even the people next door, you've never met them. You've never had them inside your house. You've never, um, you know, had their kids over except under extremely structured, you know, we're going to have a play date from 327 to 405 because at 407 I have a call and, you know, I can't be feeding children at that. Just so, you know, we have a very very, very structured, or we're all going to go, you know, on a destination birthday party to some place for 27 minutes and then leave, and we're all just go. We don't, don't talk, don't make eye contact. Uh, <laughs> you know, so it's, it's, it's very dehumanizing. Yes, and um, it's interesting because you're you're looking at the interactions. I mean, humans in general, you want you want to be able to make conversation, to talk, to just have that casual byplay. Mm. Um, and we're all instructed on how to, or I think we're all instructed on how to I have. Think, I think we used to be instructed on how to meet strangers. You know, how to how to introduce yourself. You know. And I don't think that that's necessarily... I, I think that art is another thing, Margaret, that's also that's getting true. lost. No, you I know? remember that being taught that <clears throat> as a small child. You, you, you say hello, you extend your hand, type a handshake. Look them in the eye, and yeah. you're polite. And you are polite, and there were certain rules, like you don't ask for seconds. <laughs> you never take anything from... You don't ask for seconds. If you asked for seconds, it was a death penalty. <laughs> If you're offered seconds, you can't refuse them. That's the other part, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, you know, but you can't ask. Yeah, Go ahead. Well, exactly. No, <clears throat> if they offer it, you know, you take take the one that's nearest to you. Right. <laughs> there was. You're right. You're so right. <laughs> there were all those rules. I've forgotten them. Don't reach across the plate. Take right. the one that's nearest to you. Yes. You're but reach. it's burned. <laughs> Eat it. <laughs> 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 oh my, yeah. Just it, you you weren't supposed to your reach. You never reached across someone's field of vision. Um there was all sorts of, you know, well, was, uh even at sitting at the table, you never really touched your plate until mom sat down. Well, it, within the family, but I, when you're you would have No, these... I'm saying guests if you were oh, invited. Oh, yes, exactly, home. right. Until their mom until sat down. Until their mom was <clears throat> Sit down. You didn't. You didn't stuff any food in your mouth right. because you were being polite. Because you know this is her food. 
it's not your food. Right. There, there, but there was, uh, <clears throat> so there were these defined periods. If you were meeting someone for the first time, you had certain things. There was these protocols, which you learned how to meet. It's like, it's like there's a one-on-one, how to meet people. You know? mm-hmm. And then once you became a little more familiar, the, the rules, rules got a little more relaxed and you could do different things. And, and you would also get to the point where you would be totally accepted in a variety of households up and down your neighborhood. So you could really literally walk right in, sit down, and just have, a, have a, a, an uninvited, always welcome, you know. <clears throat> that, that level of human interaction builds community. It, it builds familiarity. It builds trust uh, amongst, um, in and amongst a society. And when you take it away... You get a society which is really living in 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 communal isolation. Mm-hmm. Well, you were being taught that this family has a certain way of looking at things, and you're not always sure exactly how what you're saying or what was being done is going to be translated. So, for them, you know, to bring this particular thing over reminds me of what was that um, my big fat Greek wedding when. Her, the uh, fiance's mother brought the bunt cake and it had a hole in it. Mm-hmm. And they were horrified that this cake had a hole in it. Right. You know, this is, so they tried to make it lovely by putting a flower pot in there. It was just, right. <laughs> it's it, absurd stuff, but it's fun actually. Because you, you try to to blend your understandings together. <laughs> right. But again, and it's very human contact, right? Very human contact. And you, you basically, you tried very hard not to take offense to anything because you realized that this is a completely different culture and there was no uh, animosity or no nastiness that was trying to be um, communicated. You were just you trying to understand what this other person means by such and such or... You know, um, when our Chinese friends, they came straight out from mainland China over here and trying to understand why do Americans do this? Like the wedding, they don't have that. The whole rigmarole with the wedding, they find that a complete mystery. Mm. Well, but I want to I want to abstract what you just said. There's two things or two or three things there. Uh, uh, basically, what we were doing was always giving the other the benefit of the doubt, and, and not even the benefit of the doubt, but the, the assumption that they were trying to do something good because um, there was an unwritten sort of code of, of, if you were unfamiliar with someone, you just assume that, that nothing they were trying to do was, was, was something inimical. It was something bad. It was something good that you just didn't understand, you know, and then you had to kind of give them the benefit of the doubt and kind of figure each other out a little bit. So there was... A goodwill assumption, and it, and that came from this idea of community. You know, we're all we're all human beings. We're a little different, like we have the bun cake and all that. But I think now, if you if you come fast forward to you know to 2019, we're because we're in this kind of of insular, um, you know, scheduled and avatar and layered. Uh, so, so that people appearing on your front deck, if on your front porch with a bunt cake, would be, you know, akin to, uh, you know, to to Visigoths at the gate. Um, you mean a welcome to the neighborhood? A welcome to the neighborhood. It's a funny joke anymore. You know, they came, they were on my deck with a cake. What was I going to do? I had to, you know, call the fire department. It, it becomes this. Um, Instead of the assumption that people are are here to do good and just don't you know don't understand, but we're going to give them the benefit. It's the complete opposite. It's there if someone appears in your personal space, knocking on your door, the instant assumption is is that there's a threat that I have to reject, deflect, and defend against. You know, the instant assumption is that they're here to do something bad, and and it it really turns us into sort of a society of suspicion and mistrust and that everybody's motives are always written to the lowest 
possible. They're here to put something over on me. They're here to try and get something from me. They're here to put, you know, to, to, to well, do something bad to me. It's the old just in case, you know, well, we, with all those uh, video cameras at the door and you attached to the phone and, you know, who, they're constantly recording who's going by. It's the assumption that someone uh, may be trying to get something from you. Now, hmm. when you, it is a machine that you, and a tool that you use to be able to um, figure out whether or not there's a real problem. Hmm. But um, I think, in truth, if someone really wanted to do something to your house, that's not going to do anything. It, right. And in fact, it, I'm just saying before, let's say, when we were growing up, back in the old days, you know, back when we were growing up, um, people appearing on your front, people would appear on your front door and you would open the door and you would greet them. They might be Jehovah's Witnesses, they might be selling something door to door, whatever, but you you, you would you would have that sort of human interaction. And, <laughs> and you might waste a little bit of your time, but you would politely greet them. You would, you know, you would hear their spiel and you would send them on their way. And they, would, they knew, in essence, that they were, they were uh, counting on your hospitality and weren't going to wear it out, you know? Okay, I'm going to say this is mostly a burb thing. You realize that, right? Oh, yeah. I, I, it's not a city thing. I agree. No, it's not city, nor is it real, real country country. Because out here, if you're coming out here and uh, someone had said to me, you know, you got to watch because out in the boonies, they'll come out with a shotgun. Well, hey, hey, certainly uh, there, are, there's, there was an, uh, a recognition of familiarity that would be um, a stranger, somebody who you weren't expecting to come over. But if your neighbor, even somebody that you've only casually seen in town, showed up in your front door you would you would do um you would greet them in such a way that, that it was that it was a human to human interaction i think now that would be viewed much more suspiciously even if you've seen these people uh on a, on a regular basis the the idea that they would come to your house would be somehow uh completely Fantastic and crazy, strange. What are you doing here? I, uh, I wasn't expecting you. I, I wasn't expecting you. Right. In fact, it, it was uh, someone who was working for UPS had said, you know, the minute you wear that uniform, everybody just opens the door for you. <laughs> well, that's <laughs> another thing. Is is we give our trust away to a uniform, right? You know, or, or to a. Uh, uh, it's it's but it's the same thing only in reverse. It's like yeah. oh okay, it's the UPS man, no problem. Open the door. What do you have? Right. You know, welcome, and in welcome. they come. So we can have the human interaction with the UPS man. <laughs> so that's all you have to do. That's the solution. You have to dress all the kids up in UPS uniforms, and everyone will open the door and invite them into the living room and give them, give them cake and cake and cookies. Um, you know, and some traditions have have survived. Uh, even the internet age. So Halloween is a great one, you know. Um, that one night, we all go back to everyone coming up on the porch is treated like a human being. Oh, you're, you know, what a wonderful costume. And you want some candy and we'll have a little interaction. And, and, it, and it becomes, you know, it, at least we have something like that that still um, kind of owns our humanity. Because it, it, you don't know who the heck is coming up on your porch, but you open your door and you say, "Hey, how you doing?" <laughs> oh, it's expected. Yes, it's expected, and that um, is uh, how do I say this? It's like license. Gives permission for people to say, you know, because everyone's doing it, and it's in a neighborhood usually that you're familiar with. Right, but you but you don't know you don't really know who's coming up, <clears throat> and you put yourself on your best behavior. You're polite. Uh, you expect those who are coming are also going to be polite and not you know trash your house or do whatever the heck it is you know mess up your 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 garden your bushes, and um, 
it, it just it just it's a good exercise of the human contract, you know, of the I'll be nice to you if you be nice to me kind of thing that that used to be kind of everywhere. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um but if you let's go back a little bit. Okay. Because you we went off on a tangent. No. <laughs> All right. The human connection is vitally important. And as we mature through childhood, you know, you expect to be taught what is appropriate and what isn't in this interconnection. Now that we've got internet, as a parent, you have to be more vigilant because there's, you have access to almost anything on the Internet. So the, thus, you know, screen time. Mm. There's only so much screen time that a child is allowed to have. And they're allowed to have phones earlier and earlier. Mm. So it becomes ve- very important to be able to teach a little one how to be able to guard against stuff at an early age. Right. You know, I don't think that that's something that um, people have really focused on because it's it's a distraction not just for the child but also for the parent. You have to balance the whole thing. And the kid's looking to you to see how you balance what you're doing with your phone to how this is supposed to be handled. You know, well, I, the earlier part of that is, I think, exactly correct, is that, uh, and the latter half is correct, too, but I mean, I just want to focus on the first part, is that that idea of, the one of the ideas that, that powered the old kind of, I'll walk up on your porch, was that there was a limited community, and, and that you gave the this sort of implied license, because you knew that people from 10,000 miles away weren't going to walk up on your porch, because you were 10,000 miles away or even the next town over. It was unlikely. But you're right. Now, um, one of the reasons that we guard ourselves so much more and give ourselves so many more layers is that they're really, you really are touching the entire world, potentially, uh, through this tiny device. And so there is more unknowns that are out there than knowns anymore. And unknowns always, always engender um, you know, caution. Um, so that idea of, of having to be cautious and guard, and, and as you say, younger and younger and younger, um, we're starting to strip away these layers of innocence, you know, these layers of innocence over children that, um, you know, your parents would be the people you would interact with until you were 40. And then... <laughs> and information, I mean, it's right there. All you have to do is, is ask. And it's, uh, uh, Now, yeah. Yes. Yeah. It's right there. Before, you really had to go digging to get your information. And um, that was a little more controlled. Now, there's so much that comes at you that you have to be able to discern well, what it is that you need and what to ignore and what to basically say, well, no, that's not, that's not true. Right. Because at that point, your reality becomes manipulated and what is real and what is not. So therefore, we have our present problem well, with yeah, the media. Yeah. Oh well, that. But but really, writ large, the present um, degree of suspicion of contact and and human contact has been kind of lumped into all contact. You know, this idea that everybody is is potentially bad, if you will. And speaking of potentially bad things. Or good things. Let's go back to the studio, have a little break, have some potentially wonderful things, then we'll come back in a couple minutes.
The Fat Man Gets Out of Bed is the latest book from Michael Lines, the award-winning author of There is a Reaper. Featuring 13 original stories, this wide-ranging collection has everything. Forbidden love, gods versus demigods, weird invading aliens, sexy seductive artificial intelligence, and unusual passion between the living and the dead. All set amidst fantastic worlds of pain and loss and boundless joy. From the sublime to the macabre to the bittersweet, The Fat Man Gets Out of Bed will leave you breathless with laughter, brimming with tears, trembling with suspense. Available now on Amazon.com, Google Play, iTunes, Kobo, and fine e-tailers everywhere. The Timeless Esoterica Radio Program with Dr. Bruce is broadcast on the fourth Monday of every month at 8 p.m. Pacific, 11 p.m. Eastern, on artistfirst.com. We explore topics including the paranormal, alien life, mysteries, conspiracies, hidden history, oddities, and much more. Each show will feature a special guest with exciting and thought-provoking discussion. Always keep an open mind, an open heart, live forever, and remember Dr. Bruce believes in you. Rick Rodan fans, love mythology with plenty of action and humor? Destroyer's Blood is for you. The new fantasy novel by award-winning author Michael Lines is book one of the adventures of Dev Kalian, the Blood series. Follow Dev and his magic sword betrayer as they are suddenly attacked and forced to return to Olympus to fight in a war they want no part in. The world of men and gods is about to be destroyed by Zeus's ancient foe, and only Dev and Trey can stop him. The conflict never stops, and the amazing twist will have you on the edge of your seat. Act now while the ebook is on sale for only 99 cents. Destroyer's Blood is available on Amazon.com, Barnes & Noble, iTunes, Kobo, and fine e-tailers everywhere. And while you're there, get the free prequel. It's in the blood. Available for a limited time. Hi, this is Manette Lauren, author of Race for the Sun. Do you believe in guardian angels? Check out book one of my Soul Watcher series. It can be found on Amazon.com or anywhere fine books are sold. Go to www.manettelauren.com and you are listening to the Artist First Radio Network. There is a Reaper is the story of five-year-old Christopher Aaron and his life-changing struggle with leukemia. Winner of both the Indie Bragg Medallion as well as the reader's favorite silver medal for memoir, There is a Reaper has more than 100 Amazon book reviews and a five-star rating. It has been described as life-changing, spiritual, a must-read. Just released on Audible and iTunes, this memoir is also available in paperback and on Amazon Kindle for only 99 cents. Get your copy of this life-changing memoir today. You are listening to The Soul of the Everyman on the Artist First Radio Network. Let's get back to them. Michael and Margaret Lines. My Emi. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, and and this welcome to the uh, Soul of the the second half of the uh, of the hour, and um, we've been talking tonight about um, sort of the importance of the human connection and and how I guess it's really changed because we still have human connections even in in the current age and and once you get past all the all the avatars and all the barriers and you find that people are people and still are you know to this day. Um, able to have <clears throat> wonderful, significant relationships and able to be polite to strangers and all the other sorts of things that, that we used to do. I, I just think that uh, maybe the hurdles that we've set up um, kind of to get to us have gotten higher, and maybe they have to be. You know, there there is certainly some sense in being more guarded with yourself when the stakes are higher and mm-hmm. the uh, amount of 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 trouble that certainly young children can get into is is more serious and <clears throat> and they can get into it much more easily as you mentioned last half hour you know it's 
it's right there. It's it, it isn't that you have to go seeking trouble. It'll seek you, uh, and it'll lure that you know this. There's a there's a component of luring the innocent into into these kinds of um, of uh, of negative situations, if you will. So <clears throat> so so you can certainly see that that having this incredible resource also requires, like anything, um, vigilant management, you know, and, and we and you, it's the old genie in the bottle or Pandora's box. Once you've opened it, once you've, you know, opened the big box, it says internet, you can't close it. It's, it's here and we, and we have to live in the world we have today. So you can reminisce all you want about them good old days, but they're gone. And, um, we can still have good nowadays uh, as long as we still, you know, try to maintain ourselves even under the onslaught, under this larger umbrella of, of huge amounts of information and then necessarily huge, huge amounts of risk. True. It's just that the ways of thinking... Um, on your approach is the interactions from one person to another are usually face to face and mm-hmm. there is a certain protocol that way you you learn to feel each other out if this person is familiar with the typical greeting or do doesn't need to be modified on the screen you have to almost bring a whole different mindset on the screen mm-hmm whether it is your phone or your computer. And if someone is reaching out to interact with you, it's got to go through that screen, what would you call it, a filter, mm. in order to say, okay, this this is clear for a regular conversation. And, yeah, you do have to be more vigilant because, as you said, the range of people that are capable of making contact with you and they're not they're not familiar they're not from your neighborhood they're from different places and uh, there's been plenty of stories that we've we've had where people are getting involved in internet scams and internet uh, raising money for other people, supposedly. You know, just, can I draw you in? Is there a way for, for me to convince you that you need to part with some money or something? Right. Information. Yeah, <clears throat> information, especially. In- influence. So it creates a whole different protective face layer Mm -hmm. because you know that uh, once you hit the internet there it really isn't um, not as safe as you once thought it was well that's true okay when it first started people weren't doing stuff like this it was just brand new and the technology was developing but then someone figured out that hey, I can, I can do a few things so that I'm I'm behind a name somewhere, mm-hmm. and I can get something out of it if I do this. Right, and, and none of these things are are unknown to human nature because we are ourselves, whether we're on the internet or while, whether we're you know interacting face to face. There certainly were scams, you know, going back as far back as the human being is the human being. Um, I think what it comes down to is what you said before, is that the the opportunities for folks who want to do something are so much easier. The barriers are so much lower. Uh, if you if you wanted to defraud somebody, uh, it was a lot harder, you know, if you had to do it face to face. It had to be, you know, things that, 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 that were easily testable, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, now you can kind of create these um, personas out of thin air, 
uh, with a snap of a finger, literal, not, not figurative, not literal, snap of the finger, and then all of a sudden you're you're someone else. And and if that person um, gets discovered as being a fraud, well, then you're just someone else, and you're someone else. And so this idea of of the um, how facilely this medium can be used to conceal and potentially to, as you said, lure people in, draw people in, uh, has it's, it's become sort of this, you know, arms race between uh, what you have to do to defend yourself, you know, guard your information, guard your um, your appearance, guard your access uh, against those who uh, much more easily can find out about you and access your information and have more opportunity to uh, to lure you in. So. Uh, even though it looks very safe, the the um, the looks are deceiving, and it's been a sort of a school of hard knocks. As, as one thing we can say, Margaret, is that you and I have seen the transition, and and our and you know our the generations before us, our parents and so on, have seen this transition uh, unfold really beneath our feet uh, with with it was complete. Sea change. So we're we're at a we're at a point where things are changing dramatically. It's one of those, you know, wave changes through a society. Um, kids who are born today are, are never going to have that experience. Their world is the world we have right now, and going forward, things may go different again. But but they're taking as the status quo, as the normal, the things yeah. that we're saying are the big change. Um, Prior, you know, when we're talking about generations before this kind of sea change in society, uh, things moved slower, much more slowly. You know, you had just, uh, you could have taken your manners that were drilled into you by your mom or by your school teacher and probably applied those same principles to the 18th century or the 19th century and been just fine. You might have you might have been not polite enough, but you would have been able to get by, you know, because that those same kinds of ways of human interaction go all the way back several hundred years of, let's say, quote unquote, modern society, starting from, let's say, the 1700s. Technology wasn't there, but but certainly writing letters and greeting people and being, a, you know, going from town to town or whatever you were doing, all that happened. Um, so that te- those those societal norms could carry you right along, but then we hit this wall, <laughs> you know, and and there was like a a step function, a sea change. We had to go from things that we knew how to do as a, as a society into a world where those things didn't really work all that well anymore. And to the extent that you could take advantage of this, you could take advantage of people. And to the extent that you weren't uh, aware of what could happen, you could be taken advantage of. So it, it, it's been a kind of a steep change for, for us and for, for people maybe a little bit younger than us, but not for the kids today. It's no change. It just is. True. But it also means that unless they are taught what the value system, any kind of value system is, they are vulnerable. Yeah. You yeah. know, well, everybody does that. No. No, that doesn't, you know, everybody meaning who? <laughs> you know, the ones that you thought you knew? No. What, it becomes more important to be able to allow um ways or teach ways where a person will know whether or not something is true to them and true in their heart. In other words, to live a life where you don't have these huge regrets about your decisions. Mm. Because it, as, when you're young, you have no regrets. Normally speaking, you haven't you haven't made enough decisions to make a <clears throat> that big of an impact on your life. Now, and you are so vulnerable because you really don't know. And and when you're young, that's usually when you have learn to explore. Right. You know, you're expected to make mistakes when you're young. 
But the way things are now, um, especially when it comes to drugs or alcohol, that decision will impact you uh, harder than it had when we were young. Mm -hmm. I I know the fact that um, a number of things like the marijuana that they're creating now is far more potent than it had been when we were young, so that you're hooked on that first hit. Certainly, physical, you know, those, those kinds of physical interactions, and then you you, you were saying the, um, the 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 skills that you need to navigate this particular type of world have to be taught younger and taught much more differently. I uh, almost learned, you know, that, that that idea of innocently exploring your your um, your internet world uh, is is almost um, almost a, uh, almost impossible because unless you really wall it off, you know, and there are some things that allow you to do that. There's a steep cliff there. It isn't it isn't a gradual, you know, to use an analogy, you're not gradually walking out deeper and deeper and eventually you swim and things are it gets a little colder and no, it's you're you're in your your wading pool and then if you step over the side, you're in the ocean, you know, it's there's there's a huge um drop off. And so so the let's say the skills that they're learning today are necessary and important uh, to deal with that sort of very very steep learning curve, very quick learning curve. But I think the skills that they're not learning today, you know, the fact that everything is so structured and that is so, um, you know, uh, kind of guarded, it means that if you took uh, the internet age kid who knew nothing but and put them, you know, figuratively somehow back into the situation of, of the, the 19th century, the, 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 their way of interacting with people just doesn't work, nor does, nor does it work the other way very easily. If we, we've, what I'm trying to say is we've, we've closed a door or, or crossed a barrier, which, isn't, which is difficult to go back to the previous one. In other words, we've, we're losing some skills because of where, where, where we are over here, human interaction skills, we're gaining other ones that don't apply back here. There's, what are you, but what do you do? Well, I'm trying to say is that, is that we, a society has gone through a sort of a irreversible change here. Something you could, prior, prior generations uh, have had, to, and the one that had to live through it had to learn all this stuff, but prior generations wouldn't understand the protocol that's being used here, it has to be used here. Similarly, if you were able to take that those skills back, it wouldn't apply here anymore. And that wasn't true for a very long period of time. So the point I'm trying to make is that that's, that type of societal change, it becomes, um, it becomes a significant inflection point in, a, in the development of a culture that you can't necessarily go back through again. You know, you, you've lost something and you've gained something, and the two don't live well together anymore. You, you, you know, you can certainly say, if I know how to drive a car, I could probably drive a horse cart, or I could probably figure out how to drive some of the earlier technology. But if you go past the point where self-driving cars come in, and nobody knows how to drive a car anymore, let's say. And then you try to push them back into an era where you have to guide something with your will and your and your eyes and your skills. And they're like, I, I don't do that. It does it itself. <laughs> but, but, you just tell it to go, and it and it goes. Uh, the skill you 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 you've crossed, uh, you know, a, a real barrier that that you can't go back through anymore. It's, so it, so I'm just saying that that's a societal change that we're living through right now. This interesting times kind of stuff. Okay, so it's just we're, this is an observation. Is well, that that's, it goes back to our, our our sort of theme, you know, trying to maintain the human connection, even though we're going through a societal change. We're still people on both sides, but the skill sets are changing radically. 
Well, I think a problem arises when someone wants to do a judgment call on someone who ha- doesn't have either skill set. True. Yeah. But I'm not really looking to judge. I'm, I'm really looking to, to observe. That is part of the observation. You see the reaction that people have. Now, reactions are harder to mm. uh, to become aware of because the people just go in it and... Um, because we are taking steps in a, an internet kind of deal where there is an e-connection, you have to become more aware of what your internal state is because without that awareness, you will be manipulated into states, different states, that because you're triggered, you've already handed over that reaction to someone you allow yourself to be triggered that way instead of being aware that you are being triggered and that now you need to remove that trigger point. So what you're seeing, because you see a vast number of things on your screens these days, um, I would personally believe that learning how to hold your presence and become non-reactive is the next step. Because you're being inundated constantly by images and um, stories and people. Mm. And not to be triggered. Non-reactive means that you won't be triggered into something. That's the next step. Can you hold your awareness while seeing all the madness that's being flashed in front of you Mm. and not be be your your internal state, not be manipulated one way or another. Mm. Steered. Mm -hmm. To know when you're being manipulated and to know that you have to hold true to who you are, Mm. it's become more important, vitally important, to be able to hold that. Otherwise, you just become a a reaction. So what you're saying is that because, you know, it, 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 the significance of center and heart discernment becomes more important because of the the the, the um, severity or the or the uh, the strength of the um, triggers or the or the events and all the things that are coming at you so much higher. So, so before you might have to, um, you might have to run into people that you needed to be discerning with and guarded with, but it was as a much slower pace. The main thing I keep hearing is, oh, I'm overwhelmed by that. Why are you overwhelmed? And it's usually because you're, you're being triggered into reaction after reaction after reaction that you get to the point where you can't think. Yeah. Yeah. And that needs to be addressed. You need to be at a point where that's not there anymore. So would you would you postulate that the the kids for for whom this is normal are gonna have to learn that skill? Mhm. Yeah. And it's difficult because what you need is a a very strong sense of self in terms of um, not, not, well, I like this and I don't like that kind of thing. It's who you are as a human being and your capabilities and the gifts that were given to you. Those are precious. And there are things out there that want to take that from you. So you're saying a, a stronger sense of heart identity... It's going to be, well, key, but it's also going to be required. Yeah, it is. It is something that needs to, as as parents, this is where the next step is to teach them. It becomes vitally important uh, your early years because when you learn uh, in those early years, is foundational. It's very hard to um, figure a way to get around something that you were taught and when you were young. I'm going to say that, that I find that terribly encouraging. 
Yeah, I actually find because what I was saying before it was saying maybe ineptly before was that our society has gone through um, sort of an irreversible change. You know, a Pandora's box type of open and we can't put it back in the box. So even though it may look like chaos now, what, what we're just what we're saying right now is that that the people who for whom this is normal, not chaos, but status quo, this is how the world is, are going to have to per force develop a greater sense of who they are in that society. And I think maybe that's a good thing. It's an evolutionary thing. Well, this is why I feel that the millennials are very misunderstood. Yeah. Because they're not functioning the old way, which is where most people want to be able to judge. They understand what's going on, but and they accuse the millennials of being very selfish. But the truth of the matter is there is a core understanding that unless you have that sense of who you are, you will be manipulated and they know, they know that their, what they put their eyes on is very precious. Mm. When they're young, you, we have said this before on the screen, there will be things coming in um, that you just didn't want to see, all these advertisements that come in, etc., and they're vying for your attention. Right. So the millennials know that their attention is very important, but in order to survive, they're going to have to focus on themselves first to be able to begin to know their core. They right. yearn for for core. What I found is Whenever uh, a millennial comes across someone who's living at their core, that frequency that's really uh, pure, they pay more attention. Right. And they won't listen to anyone unless they see that that connection is there. It's very encouraging. And and I think you're, you, I think you've come exactly to the right point here is that these people, the people who are the next generation, who will be running the world, whether we like it or not, are going to have to know themselves very well and have a real good sense of, of core. And that's, that's it's very encouraging. Oh, I have <laughs> faith in the human spirit. Yeah. Because it knows that this is not right and it knows when it is. And I believe we've come to the end of our hour. It's right. It feels right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I am Margaret. And E am Michael. <laughs> and thank you for listening. Ready, Jade? I've got a surprise adventure you're going to love. Really?